When it comes to Disney's classic animated films, today there's no shortage of ways to view them, whether it's on Disney+, Blu-ray, iTunes, and the like. So it's hard to imagine there was once a time when owning your favorite Disney films was a vision of the future. And even when it did become a reality, was only the beginning of years upon years of convoluted marketing tactics, trickery, and maddening sales gimmicks. So let's explore the history and evolution of Walt Disney Home Video and the origins of the infamous Disney Vault on this episode of Yesterworld. The Ultimate Treasury of Disney Magic The story begins in the 1980s, but for a little more context leading up to these events, we actually have to go a little further back in time to the 1940s. You see, Walt Disney Studios, like most of the country, was unable to escape the harsh realities of World War II. In their case, it was changing their priorities from animated feature films to wartime training films, educational shorts, and moral-boosting propaganda. But understandably, these were far from profitable, so Walt Disney and his brother Roy decided to re-release Snow White and the Seven Dwarves into theaters for a little financial support in 1944. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is more than a great picture. It's a thrilling experience in happiness. The re-release, or reissue, was an incredible success, and thus began the Disney tradition of re-releasing a feature-length animated film every five to ten years after its initial debut. Though it is worth mentioning that some received fewer releases based on lower box office performance. Every time a film left theaters, it was referred to as having gone into the Disney vault, and would only be taken out of the vault for another theatrical re-release. Even as the years went by and television came into the picture, Disney's animated feature films were very unique in that they were never, ever seen outside of theaters. This was in stark contrast to other studios who took full advantage of television's rise in popularity, as while there wasn't a way to own films at this point, movies finally had a life outside of theaters. But that was only the beginning. Hello, I am Cartrevision. I offer you and your family immediate access to TV programs. Your choice of feature-length films, educational and cultural materials, and your own home movies. Technically, the first attempt at home video entertainment was in 1972, with the first consumer-grade VCR, or video cassette recorder, called Cartrevision. For the first time ever, you could rent a feature-length film from a wide range of titles and view them from home. But Disney was one of the only studios who refused to allow any of their movies to be featured in this early vision for home video. The primary reason was the Cartridge Vision's other ability, recording television programs on the tape, as Disney was strongly against what they saw as a gateway into piracy. You see, I can bring you whatever you want to see, whenever you want to see it. Unfortunately, the Cartridge Vision's film rentals could only be ordered from a catalog and watched a single time without the ability to even rewind. And while the plan was to release a standalone version the next year, the initial device only came pre-packaged with the TV and saw terrible sales. So within a single year, the entire device was abandoned. However, the home video entertainment revolution was near and truly began in the mid-70s with the Betamax and VHS. Some of the best movies on television aren't on television, because now you can buy full-length, uncut movies on cassettes. Movies like Pat and Hello, Dolly, and lots more. With Selectivision, you can go to the movies, at your house! While initially the Betamax and VHS devices were pretty darn expensive, especially when adjusting for inflation, they were incredibly successful and changed home media forever. Virtually every movie studio was quick to hop on board, releasing both new titles and older films, except for Disney. You see, much like Cartrevision, one of the major selling points of Betamax and VHS was the ability to record television broadcasts. This ranged from TV shows to sporting events and, of course, movies, all of which, as predicted by Disney, led to a massive tidal wave of bootleg videos and piracy. So Disney and Universal Studios filed a lawsuit against Sony, who invented and manufactured the Betamax, which in turn led to the VHS, hoping to destroy the future of both devices. However, Disney was still at least interested in the concept of home entertainment, and Universal felt they had the perfect solution. Disco Vision. Disco 
Disney licensed six titles to Universal to be released on Discovision, many of which were segments and animated shorts from their Disneyland TV series. Unfortunately, immediately upon release in 1978, Discovision was riddled with problems and was a commercial failure. To add further insult to injury, the next year, Disney lost the court battle against Sony to kill the Betamax and VHS. However, Disney still wanted a piece of the home video market pie, which led to a new branch of the company, Walt Disney Home Video. A short time later, and rather ironically, Disney released 14 live-action titles and various cartoon shorts on Betamax and VHS. It's like the saying goes, I guess, if you can't beat them, join them. However, noticeably missing were any of Disney's feature-length animated films. You see, while some Disney executives were all for selling the true Disney classics on home video, others feared this would lower their value and dissuade audiences from seeing them in theaters during the reissue periods. So in 1981, a compromise was made. Disney compiled a list of their most iconic and lucrative animated features, known as the Untouchables, that would never, ever be released on video, and the only way to ever see them would be in theaters. The ones not on the list consisted of various anthology films or anything that had already aired on Disney's television series. These included Alice in Wonderland and Dumbo, which Walt Disney himself had chosen to air as condensed versions in the 1950s, and were released alongside the other non-untouchables on VHS and Betamax in 1981. Come home to all your good friends. Mickey. Alice. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh and many more. Now available from Walt Disney Home Video. Great! Fast forward a few years later, in which a certain and heavily criticized individual became CEO of the Walt Disney Company, Ron Miller. Hi, I bet you thought I was going to say Michael Eisner, didn't ya? Ron Miller's innovative and forward-thinking ideas are often severely unappreciated, such as creating the Disney Channel and Touchstone Pictures, essentially allowing Disney to release non-squeaky clean movies without affecting the brand. But shareholders strongly disagreed with a number of his financial decisions, and many saw his rise in the company as nepotism due to his marriage to Walt Disney's daughter. But Ron Miller was the very first in the company to suggest they create a special series called Walt Disney Classics, which would feature the untouchable animated films on home video. The idea didn't go very far, as in 1984, after a single year as CEO, Ron Miller was essentially kicked out of the company. And who took his place? Michael Eisner. <laughs> whoa, whoa, what is now going on in the studio? <laughs> Guess who? Now, like it or not, while it's incredibly easy to poke fun and criticize Michael Eisner, as we'll do in my eventual series, how Michael Eisner saved and then almost completely destroyed the Magic Kingdom, he really did save and revitalize the company. A major factor was his determination to continue the forward-thinking and innovative path Ron Miller began, including the idea for a Walt Disney Classics line of home video releases. Perhaps due to Eisner's history at Paramount Pictures, or his undeniable charm, despite the hesitation of the more conservative board members, he was able to convince them to release a handful of the Untouchables on video, with the catch. Introducing Walt Disney Home Video's first release in the Classics line, Robin Hood. Now, a whole new generation of children and their parents can experience the splendor of this timeless classic right in their own home. After a brief re-release in the theaters, the first entry into the Disney Classics collection was Robin Hood in 1984. But the second, and far more anticipated, was the all-time classic Walt Disney animated feature film, Pinocchio. Much like Robin Hood, the film was given a re-release in the theaters, then a short time later, the once-untouchable Pinocchio finally came to home video. But remember how I said there was a catch? It's the long-awaited release on video of the crown jewel of Disney animation art, Pinocchio. They'd probably want to watch it again and again and again. 21 times. And you could watch it in your pajamas. I think it'd be fun to have a popcorn party and watch Pinocchio. You mean I can buy it? Well, technically, yes, but Disney didn't want you to, and that was part of the catch. I would probably rent it. Bingo. 
You see, to appease the hesitant executives, the entries into the classics collection had to be priced so high that realistically, only video stores would buy them at a staggering $79.95 or $227.64 adjusting for inflation. This would encourage families to simply rent the films as opposed to owning them, as many at Disney still believe that theatrical re-releases were the key to their future longevity and profitability, and owning the films would interfere with this. Despite the heavy price tag, Pinocchio and Robin Hood sold over 100,000 copies, but it was clear to executives like Michael Eisner and President Frank Wells that relying almost entirely on video rentals was ignoring the countless parents who were willing to spend a bit more to own the films. I guess I'd buy Pinocchio. That's, that will last forever. So with the help of the previous head of Paramount Pictures Home Video, who had left the studio alongside Michael Eisner to become Disney's head of home video, they somehow convinced the board members to try a little experiment for the holiday season of 1985. a Walt Disney video cassette like Pinocchio for $29.95. Beginning in December, the prices of both Robin Hood and Pinocchio were drastically reduced by over 60% to match the other titles. This would target not video rental stores, but parents, who could finally justify buying the classic Disney animation for their kids. As part of this new strategy, Disney would make it clear that after the holidays, no more copies would be sold until its next theatrical re-release more than half a decade later. And thus began the true implementation of the infamous Disney Vault gimmick, in which a Disney classic was re-released into theaters, then made available on video for a very limited time. This would increase urgency and exclusivity as within a matter of months, Disney would pull them off the shelves until the next theatrical re-release, six to seven years later. Don't you wish you bought Pinocchio when you had the chance? Wouldn't you love to have Lady and the Tramp in your collection? Now they're gone. And time's running out for Cinderella, too. But you still have a chance to own Disney's most celebrated animated masterpiece. It's Bambi. Still available, but for a very limited time. No one should grow up without Bambi. Okay, you might think I'm exaggerating, but the marketing for these Disney classics was just as genius as it was manipulative, with countless advertisements focusing on the devastation of children if parents waited too long to purchase a copy. Uh-oh, I think we waited too long. The last one looks like it's gone. Going even further, any new feature-length animated film, such as The Black Cauldron or The Great Mouse Detective, went straight from theaters into the Disney vault. So if you were a fan of Disney's newest animated feature film and couldn't wait to own it, tough luck because it would only be released on video after another theatrical re-release five to seven years later. But then a little movie came along that would once again change the Disney home video release model forever. It's here. The most highly acclaimed, the most successful, the most talked about new animated motion picture is now yours to own on video cassette. The Little Mermaid. In 1990, with the massive success of The Little Mermaid, Disney performed another experiment by releasing it on home video, not years later, but less than six months after its theatrical run. The results were astounding as it became the highest selling video in the US and would officially end the practice of new Disney animated films going straight into the vaults after hitting theaters. Instead, they went straight from movie theaters to home video, guilting consumers to buy them before going into the vault. Aladdin on video. It's here, but get it before it's gone. I'm out of here! Out of here! Out of here! I'm out of here! But now it's time to address the elephant in the room, as the ability to finally own these classic Disney animations meant families could re-watch their favorite movies over and over and over, and spot some, um, oddities that weren't caught while in theaters. It first began with a VHS cover of The Little Mermaid, as some noticed a rather peak peculiar shape within the towers. However, despite popular belief, with the exception of a single grocery store temporarily removing the videos after a single complaint, it was never officially recalled by Disney. The supposed recall was simply the movie going into the Disney vault like the others, as the company saw the whole thing as a giant misperception. 
But then you had the movie itself, as in the wedding scene, the preacher appeared to be a little too excited for the bride and groom's special day and drew many complaints over the years. However, one instance that did result in the video officially being recalled was the blank and you will miss it scene in The Rescuers. <laughs> Obviously, I won't show it here, but the second VHS release contained two frames of a woman who should have put up some curtains. There was also a scene in The Lion King that seemed to spell out the word sex, and Aladdin allegedly telling viewers to take off their clothes. These eventually led to a number of lawsuits against Disney that were, of course, quietly handled by their team of lawyers, but were serious enough to edit out of future releases and force executives to keep a closer eye on the finished product. You're not gonna believe what I got you to take. Look, it's Fantasia. Between you and me, this was our only chance to get it, and I didn't want you to miss it. The 1990s saw even more first-time releases of Disney's past and present animated feature film canon on video, most of which, per the business model, were preceded by a theatrical re-release. It also saw the end of the video format war, which declared VHS the true winner, as after the release of Peter Pan, Disney completely abandoned Betamax forever. But even more importantly, this period of Disney's home video revolution revealed the true brilliance, or manipulation, of the infamous Disney Vault gimmick for maximum profit, as within just a few years after release, copies of movies as recent as The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast were almost impossible to find, with previous titles even more so, and this resulted in a lot of desperate parents. Keep in mind, auction sites like eBay and online resellers were still many years away from becoming the norm, so getting a hold of out-of-print copies was incredibly difficult. To capitalize on this desperation, Disney began to re-re-release animated films like Pinocchio and Robin Hood on VHS, and re-re-re-release titles like Alice in Wonderland and Dumbo. This is also when any real classification or hierarchy of Disney films was thrown out the window, beginning the confusing and convoluted release patterns we all know and love. I mean, sure, now we see titles in the original classics collection such as The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, or even Aladdin, and it makes total sense. But at the time they were released on video, the movies were only a few months old, so Disney essentially began to classify literally every new Disney animation as a classic no matter what without giving it the time to actually earn the status of a classic like the first entries into the collection. I know it seems like a petty complaint now, but just wait until later. 1994 saw the first time release of The Fox and the Hound, and was also the final entry into the classics collection. However, a new collection was on its way that would amplify Disney's tedious release strategy even further. Now the first entry into the Masterpiece collection makes total sense, as up until then, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs had never been released on home video, so it was a pretty big deal. It was also the last of the so-called Disney Untouchables to be released on video, and went on to produce record-breaking sales. But once again, Disney began to re-release titles for the third, fourth, or fifth time on home video. Now to play devil's advocate on the whole VHS re-release strategy, one could argue that since the major drawback of VHS tapes were that they degrade over time, especially with repeat viewings, these new Disney collections were a way to replace worn down copies. But since they did almost exactly the same thing with the far less popular Laserdisc versions, which don't degrade over time, I think we all know the real reason. It also continued the rather presumptuous tradition of the previous series, in which literally every single new Disney animated film was automatically defined as a classic, or in this case, a masterpiece. One of these things is not like the others. Yet the collection also featured titles like The Black Cauldron, which Disney has infamously treated like the unwanted stepchild in their Disney canon, even going so far as to pretend it never existed years later. What was the first Disney animated feature to use CG? The Great Mouse Detective. Mm, trouble. 
Once again, with each new release, consumers were incentivized to purchase these Disney masterpieces as soon as possible, before they disappeared and went back into the Disney vault. Now I just gotta stress that I'm not exaggerating about the ridiculousness of this whole situation, as near the end of the classic series, newspapers regularly posted timelines, countdowns, level of rarity, and strategies on how to find them before they were gone. For example, by 1996, second-hand copies of The Little Mermaid were selling for over $200, and that's not even counting the insane ahead-of-their-time eBay-like scammers who I truly hope no one fell for. So when The Little Mermaid was officially re-released on video for the Masterpiece Collection after nearly 10 years in the Disney vault, copies flew off the shelves, as was the case for almost every entry into this new series. For a limited time, you can give your children memories they'll have forever. <laughs> the special collector's edition of Walt Disney's timeless classic, Bambi. Enjoy it again for the very first time. For a limited time, enjoy it again for the very first time. Okay, Disney, you get five points for that one. The final videos in the Masterpiece Collection were Alice in Wonderland and Robin Hood in 1999, and would also see the final Disney release on Laserdisc. However, soon another disc format would provide even more opportunities for Disney's re-re-re-release model. The wait is over. For the first time ever, the timeless classics that generation after generation has come to love have found a new home on Disney DVD. In 1999, Disney announced their plans to release eight animated classics on Disney DVD, a collection labeled as the Limited Issue series. But these were intentionally devoid of any real supplemental bonus features, which was honestly the biggest straw of the new format aside from picture quality. This was done, at least in my opinion, as a test for consumers to see if they'd purchased the same movie on DVD more than once, only with new bonus features and the allure of a new collection, because less than six months later, Disney did just that. Presenting the Walt Disney Gold Classic Collection. Now a child might even imagine they can soar to the rescue, like in The Rescuers Down Under. Or learn the joy of giving, like in Robin Hood. How oh, can I ever thank you? I only wish I could do more. Here. Yeah. You see, Disney, I assume, realized that DVDs don't wear down like VHS tapes, so the only way to entice consumers to purchase the exact same movie over and over was with new bonus material within a new collection. Oh, and each of these DVD releases also saw a new VHS re-release -re for the... <sighs> I've lost count of how many times, so for the sake of my sanity and your sanity, we're only talking about Disney DVDs from here on out, because I cannot talk any more about VHS re-re-re-releases or I'm gonna lose my mind. Who am I kidding? I've already lost it. Why did I even st to Disney's credit, what made this Gold Classic series especially unique is how, unlike previous issues, these were to be available for a full two years after release. But of course, nothing lasts forever. One of the great films of all time is going away for 10 years. Hurry and buy Snow White on video and DVD before it disappears. But it's not too late. Because on January 31st, it's going back into the Disney vault. Get it before it's gone. Beginning with Snow White in 2001, the new plan was to release one of Disney's top 10 best-selling animated classics of all time each year for 10 years, but this was later changed to 13 animated films over 8 years, so far less poetic. Each title within this new Platinum collection would be filled to the brim with never-before-seen documentaries, deleted scenes, plenty of bonus features, and your very first panic attack. This Disney DVD is enhanced with Disney's Fast Play. Your movie and a selection of bonus features will begin automatically. To bypass Fast Play, select the main menu button at any time. Fast Play will begin in a moment. However, this time, as a way to replace the traditional theatrical re-release strategy prior to a home video release, thanks to the massive success of Fantasia 2000's IMAX run, most of the classics were to receive a special IMAX presentation, many of which to feature a new sequence or musical number. The first was Beauty and the Beast, which featured the deleted song Human Again that was used in the Broadway musical. Next was The Lion King, featuring The Morning Report. However, unlike Beauty and the Beast, this was not a deleted scene or song, but solely from the Broadway musical and made especially for the IMAX release. Next was to be Aladdin, in which a three-minute preview was featured in front of The Lion King. After that was to be The Little Mermaid, which by November of 2002 was in the process of being cleaned up for the release. 
Unfortunately, while Aladdin was already finished being remastered for IMAX by 2003, Due to the poor box office performance of Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, Disney not only abandoned the scheduled IMAX releases, but the long-held annual tradition of theatrical re-releases altogether. So ironically, the fear of all those Disney executives two decades earlier finally became a reality. Disney classics had lost their value in the theatrical market. For now. Everything you know about DVD just got a whole lot better. 2006 would see the final Disney video release on VHS, as by this point, the rise in high-definition home entertainment had begun, and either HD DVD or Blu-ray were to replace the VHS as the new side-by-side -side release with Disney standard DVD. Though several live-action titles were released on Blu-ray, Disney held off on releasing any of their animated classics on either format until there was a clear winner. By 2008, it was clear HDVD lost the battle, so after finishing up the Platinum series with a few Blu-ray versions in 2009, Disney began a new series called The Diamond Collection. But after so many releases and proof that these classics would inevitably see another re-release in the near future, Disney couldn't possibly think consumers would fall for The Jungle Book Diamond Edition, only for a limited time. Oh, come on. Yeah, man. The company continued to use the Disney Vault strategy, but was also simultaneously releasing the same animated films on iTunes, so what the heck, Disney? And do you know how frustrating it is to track down an out-of-print copy of Sleeping Beauty for a very specific bonus feature, only to find out I had the wrong out-of-print version and had to go to eBay to find an even earlier out-of-print version? It's madness, I can't take it anymore. In 2011, Disney gave animated film theatrical re-releases another go, but with a new strategy, 3D conversions. The first was The Lion King, followed by Beauty and the Beast in 2012. Next was to be The Little Mermaid in 2013, but in a very bizarre case of deja vu, the nationwide event was cancelled outside of a brief release at the El Capitan Theater, and Disney abandoned the classic animated film re-release strategy once again. That is, until they realized they could simply remake the animated films and release them into theaters under the disguise of live-action adaptations. Okay, so that's just my own conspiracy theory, but it makes total sense. After the Diamond Collection finished in 2015 came the Signature Collection, which seemed to finally, finally at long last abandon the Disney Vault gimmick, with the focus of digital being the primary incentive. So what's next for Disney Home Video? Well, with the release of their streaming service Disney+, Plus, the Signature Collection may very well be the final collection of the physical releases. But I will say, all jokes aside, as someone who truly appreciates the documentaries, interviews, and rare behind-the-scenes footage featured on these past releases, as convoluted as it can and has been across all these collections, it'll be a true shame if the new digital age means the end of these incredible glimpses into the makings of our favorite Disney animated films. So here's to the best marketing scheme, I mean, concept, in home video entertainment history. As always, thank you all so much for watching. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell, as it really does help a lot. And we'll see you next time in Yesterworld.